What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Too Much Test Podcast, episode 21. I am here with Sam Stolt. You can find him on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube under his name. I am here with David Dimasquita. Uh, you can find him on Instagram and YouTube under dynamite underscore D and YouTube under his regular name. I'm Test Your Levels. You're probably not even going to look for me online, but you're going to be looking for this guy. This is, I'm very happy to announce, Nelson Virgil. If you listened to the last one, you obviously know Nelson knows his stuff. He's been through a lot. He's a warrior. He is a huge proponent for men's health, and I'm very, very honored to have him on. Nelson, where can anyone who's listening to this find you? Excelmail.com is one of my sites. And by the way, thank you for having me. Uh, E-X-C-E-L mail.com. And discountedlabs.com, which is my blood testing uh, company that you can buy your own blood tests online. Wonderful. So we were just talking about blood tests and, you know, you don't need, you don't need to go to your doctor to get blood. You can go online, order labs from, from Nelson here. Um, and we were talking about, he's saying, he's telling people not to freak out about getting their estradiol tested all the time. And it's bad for his business, but people don't care. They still are buying it. It's like one of his number one sellers. He was just saying, so tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. It, you know, there are two types of uh, estradiol tests. You know, there's a uh, immuno essay based one, ECLIA. It's an old, the old test that has been used for years. Um, it's good for women because they have enough estrogen, estradiol, and those ranges is actually not inaccurate. It's also cheaper. It takes, it takes uh, less time to do. And there's the other one called the sensitive in lab core or the ultra sensitive on Quest. It's the same test. They just call it ultra <laughs> sensitive. And it's done by liquid chromatography uh, slash mass spectrometry, which is a lot fancier. It's really now become the gold standard of hormone testing, not only for estradiol, also for testosterone, for DHT, for prolactin. Um, a lot of hormones now that most the doctors in the know will only prescribe those tests, LC slash MS, okay? Um, so anyways... The old test, you know, was used all the time, and many of the studies are based on the old test. But as time went by, we started finding out that men, I think David in the previous video mentioned CRP, uh, an inflammatory marker, that men with higher CRP tended to, um, this test tended to overestimate their estradiol. It was an interference with the uh, immunoassay. So estradiol would be 20, 30% higher than it should be. Um, on paper. So now then doctors that know, you know, the stuff are prescribing this test uh, sensitive for lab core or ultra sensitive estradiol since it tends to be more, um, more accurate because it doesn't have their interference, interference with um, CRP or interference with like something like biotin. Biotin is a supplement that a lot of guys are taking for hair growth, um, even though the data is kind of iffy. Um, it tends to interfere with uh, testosterone uh, tests done the old way, estradiol tests the old way, and thyroid testing, which is all immune of essay. And that's something nobody tells you. Hey, you're taking one of those uh, high biotin supplements. I would say stop three days, two days, three days before going to the lab. And nobody tells you that. And that's unfortunate because we have very strong data. Anyways, but if you have to choose anytime you get any hormone tested except thyroid if we don't have lcms there um look for google testosterone lcms or this kind of labs i already took care of that i do not sell these the regular uh, tests on testosterone i just don't want guys to even buy it so i don't make it an option estradiol is is the number one seller on this kind labs.com guys are obsessed and we've been told for years and years and years that estrogen is bad for men testosterone is bad for women. Obviously, we know that. We know better about testosterone in women. This is more, I think there's more discussion that women have testosterone, they need it for the same reasons we need it. Muscle mass, uh, sexual function, mood, the same. Obviously, they have a tenth of what we have. So I'm not going to go into that details on that. But men need estrogen, men estradiol, the same way. Nature was not, we have a yin and yang. And obviously, we have less estradiol than women. Although many men have, or most men, especially on TRT, we have higher estradiol than women um, that have gone through menopause. <laughs> so I just want yeah. to say that. That's an interesting thing just to drop. But um, so men are really, uh, most guys are terrified 
of getting gynecomastia or the increase in breast tissue under the nipple, which really the data, and I've read all the studies trying to see whether estradiol was a main culprit for that growth, but really many things, several things have to happen for gyno to occur. You have to have low testosterone to estradiol ratio, meaning you have low testosterone, estradiol is higher. You know, the ratio, we can discuss that, but it's usually 14, 10, depending on the units. You have low testosterone, estradiol ratio, and you also have, believe it or not, very strong data on that, IGF-1, high IGF-1, which is growth hormone, the metabolite growth hormone. So obviously in, in our teenage years, when we're you know, obviously becoming men and women, our IGF-1 goes up. Uh, sometimes testosterone goes up, but not as much as estradiol. And also you have to have a genetic predisposition. There's actually a polymorphism that has been uh, uh, identified in men that have to be are more prone to having growth of uh, the, the tissue, the breast tissue under the nipple, not fat growth. By the way, there's difference between fat buildup on your breast as a man or actually uh, a gland issue where you are pinching under your nipple and you feel a little cherry-like um, harder uh, uh, material there. So that is gyno. Gyno is that, not, not fat. I mean, some people say, well, that's gyno. Say, eh. <laughs> that's fat. Anyway, so, um, so guys are obsessed. They get on testosterone. They get on testosterone. And obviously, their estradiol goes up. Estradiol is the main estrogen, by the way. There are three, but that's what they go up because 0.4%, 0.4% of testosterone becomes aromatized to estradiol in fat, in fat tissue, in the liver, even in the tes testicles. So guys freak out and say, yeah, of course your estradiol is going up because the body's trying to keep that ratio, it's trying to keep that balance. Um, and why do we need estradiol? We need estradiol because we need it for bone density. Men with low estradiol, several studies on this, lose bone density. And you don't want to lose bone density. I'm 63. I'm like, I already had a DEXA scan. It's like, oh shit, because, you know, you don't want to have <laughs> You don't want to have fractures. Uh, I, I had a friend that didn't know had low bone density. He he had pneumonia, started coughing and broke his ribs. You know, just coughing. So, anyways, so low bone density. Estradiol. We have data now. Last year it started to come out. Two years ago, I'm sorry. That the lower the estradiol, if you have very low estradiol, you tend to put on more fat. I know fat and estradiol has all. Um, and uh, libido. We just uh, it was published. Uh, Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, Basin, Dr. Basin, who's Basin was our god in HIV back in the days because he really he did a lot of the steroid testing uh, studies for us. He actually is the only researcher that has used 600 milligrams a week of testosterone, not in HIV positives. He used it on eugonadal men, mean men with not even low testosterone. He you, he did a cycle of 10 weeks of 600 milligrams a week, just to see what happened to these guys, you know, and the blood testing. And, all. and that was in the 90s. He did this in the 90s. He's a, he's a brilliant. He's still around and publishing these papers are usually ahead of their time. He just published uh, two, three weeks ago about the fact that guys that start on testosterone, the ones that had the higher increase of, this, of estradiol tend to have better sex drive and lower fat. They just uh, uh, excel male has. By the way, excel male has all these studies. We have a section on estradiol. So I, I'm tired. I do videos. I do lectures, telling guys, hey, you know, it's it's not about this the high estradiol. It's about the the ratio. What's the ratio, Nelson? Uh, my doctor prescribed uh, an estrosol, uh, one milligram three times a week, and I feel worse now. So the key word in excel male that is very popular is crashed estradiol. I crashed my estradiol. I feel no, I don't have any sex drive and I have no sensitivity on my penis. So obviously that's very low strata. I'm not saying that just taking an astrosol will cause that. So an astrosol, in my point of view, is it's it's a breast cancer drug. It's a an aromatase inhibitor. And men are taking it like crazy because their doctors don't know that estrogen is important. Obviously, I'm not saying high estrogen. Mm -hmm. What we are gonna find out, and this is me getting into philosophy. We're going to look back at 2022 or 2020, and when I'm, I'm gone, I'm going to be there. 2030, and you guys are going to be alive. You're young. You're going to look back, and they're going to start saying, my God, they were so dumb back then, looking at one hormone at a time, when in fact is, because we're going to have mathematical mothers, we already have AI, 
that sees that hormones are an universe that is all connected, you know, like estradiol, testosterone, thyroid, you know, it's all a world. So you say, oh, my testosterone is good, but my thyroid is screwed up and my estradiol. So they all work together in ratios that we know very little about. And we will in less than 10 years because now we have computer models that can follow that. Anyways, I'm digressing. Back in You know what I wanted to, Nelson, I wanted to mention real quick is that in the TRT community, it's, it seems like there's two people on two sides. It's either let your estrogen get as high as it possibly goes or, you know, or it, they look at estrogen in black and white, you know, and I try to tell people medicine is not black and white. You know, you could take 10 milligrams of something. I could take 10 milligrams of something. I could have a seizure. You could feel better, you know? And so I just, I don't like when people say, I mean, for me, I don't need, I don't need an astrazole. I mean, and when people say high estrogen, maybe someone hits seventies for their estrogen. And maybe if they take the tiniest little bit of an astrazole, it gets them down to like 55 or 60 and they feel good right there. You know, I don't have anything against that. Now I would, I would. Obviously, I think the less medicine you have to take, the better. I just, it's just weird that it's weird that estrogen became the biggest argument in TRT. And it's weird how it's so polarizing and black and white. So I just found that interesting. Yeah. I wanted to interject I would, that. I would tell anybody that if you're watching any video on YouTube and you see a black and white approach to any hormones, run away. Run away. Because obviously that tells you that person knows nothing because it's not black and white in any hormones. Because as I said, you can have great testosterone and a screwy t- t- you know, thyroid function, and you don't have any benefits. You basically will feel no benefits. Or if you have, I'm not in any of those two school of thoughts. I know one thing. Low estradiol is bad. Like less than 20 uh, picograms per milliliter has been shown to decrease muscle, uh, body, uh, bone density, fat mass gain, gains, and now libido too uh, lower. So I know that because there's data on that. We don't have any data on high estradiol and what that means when we actually consider testosterone levels too. We have a little bit of data on testosterone to estradiol ratio and fertility. We do a little. So a lot of researchers are now starting to look at ratios. Okay. So first of all, I do, I'm not against an estrosol. I'm against, I'm against like more than one milligram a week for sure, even one milligram. And anybody that lowers their sensitive estradiol under 20, I really I think that's a bad thing. If it doesn't hurt you now, when you're 63 or 65, you know, older, you're going to regret it because your bone densities and many other things. So let's let's get that out of the way. I'm not in either one of those scenarios. But I do believe that some men may have genetic mutations that make him more prone to issues with high estradiol. So I'm not, we don't have enough data on that. I just think that if your testosterone is high, and by the way, let me let me explain what that means because that's so there's so much <laughs> lab core. Well, lab core has a different range than quest. Oh my gosh. Okay, on, on testosterone, total and free. Everybody has because they have their own database. The CDC did a review, they have their own up to 926. Estradiol, the same thing. Lab core has a range. I work with Quest, I have to say, but they have like uh, they consider 29 estradiol to be high. So obviously, when the results people get the results, they freak out when they see high estradiol. I'm gonna say I'm not disclosing obviously private information, but uh, 90% of the guys that get tested through the scanner labs have testosterone over 900. Uh, most of them average over a thousand. Most of them have estradiol over 45, um, and that's fine because they have high testosterone. So all the data we have on estradiol, very limited data, is on men with low testosterone. So one one study showed that cardiovascular mortality increased once you reach 40 picograms per milliliter of the old test uh, for men that had an average of 325 nanograms. We are not those men. Most (laughs) people watching this show or the podcast are not that group. We are the mm, 700 to, well, the bodybuilders go up to whatever. I've seen 2,700, which they'll see EMS, a liquid chromatography test can actually measure. There's no upper limit. That's something else that people like about this test. There's no upper limit. 
the other one, the older one had a 1500 nanogram upper limit. So guys are always looking for testosterone, no upper limit. Anyways, I'm sorry, I lost, I lost track of what we're no. saying. Okay, so, re, re, refocus me. <laughs> David, yeah. David, David, go ahead. Let me hone you in for a second because you said a few things and I have like three relatively big questions back to back. Um, so you brought up some things about the future. Um, one, um, have you looked into Dutch testing? Do you use any Dutch testing for metabolite testing? That was one. The other thing is correlation between leaky gut and estrogen. I see high, I've seen correlation time and time again with leaky gut permeability and the recirculation of estrogen increasing estradiol, but they have no gyno issues. And then the other one, that, which was the future, was HPA TA dysfunction. So that's what the medical community calls it. We know it as adrenal fatigue, but it's not recognized that abundantly in the medical community yet. You're talking about testosterone levels being bad, sex hormones thyroid levels being off or like one or the other instead of looking at them as a system. But what I am looking at is I'm looking at HPTA dysfunction, optimizing HP, the hypothalamus pituitary axis way for those of you listening. Then you need less gear to actually get more testosterone benefits out of it, a better testosterone to estrogen ratio and progesterone and prolactin levels. And you get a better functioning thyroid so you can burn more body fat on top of it. If your gut's off, then you're recirculating more estrogen. You're probably storing more body fat. So I look at it in three major pieces to this puzzle. And I'm really curious to see where your stance is at because I view the future as us looking at brain functionality for, to feeding all this and liver functionality because that's where we produce our hormones. So big questions, Dutch test, HPTA dysfunction, and then... Um, Leaky gut and elevated estradiol. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> wow. Dave, well, this has been it. very generous. He's been very <laughs> generous with our his time. He just asked him like three hours worth of I'm, questions. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geek, man. I'm a nerd. I like I like talking, and it's so hard for because I don't have, I don't usually talk about this stuff that I like. Obviously, yeah, and it's great to have you guys. I mean. It's it's great to be with nerds and geeks together. Okay, let me say <laughs> it, it is. Well, I mean, like, I, I'm yeah. thoroughly. I, I I can't speak uh, for you guys, but I'm thoroughly enjoying the conversation and learning and listening. So I appreciate your time. But go ahead. That's why I, I Friday. You know, Friday afternoon and after this, I'll probably go for Mexican food and margaritas. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I like I love talking about this because um, obviously I've, I you know obviously I've read a lot, but also see a lot of the stuff that's happening on Excel mail and, you know, I have a Facebook group called testosterone replacement discussion. There's 22,000 guys too. So, you know, I, I watch what's happening. I know exactly what's hot happening, what the hot keywords are every few weeks. And sometimes it's the same old stuff anyways, but um, the Dutch testing, Dutch is expensive. Dutch is interesting. Um, I've really, the, the reporting is really interesting. I think they're, I think Dutch is ahead of the game in the way they're looking at hormones in relation with each other. It's an expensive test. It's not really well known by physicians. I don't mm -hmm. sell it. Um, I have never talked to them, even though I don't, I don't have any, uh, I've looked into it. I've never gotten it done myself, uh, but I've seen the reporting. I, I have friends that are more of a biohackers than I've ever will be. Um, so I have nothing against, I think they, they are onto something because they're looking at the relations of the thyroid and testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, they're looking at all that. And that's why it's probably costly because it's really a very intricate report, color graphs. And so I don't have an opinion about Dutch to be honest okay. with you. I never had it done. And, um, but I know they, they have a lot of references in scientific, you know, journals. So. I know they're not just, um, you know, they're, they're not trying to get, take people's money for nothing because I love that, especially in gene testing right now, DNA testing, there are a lot of companies out there uh, claiming stuff that, that is not being proven. The mutations are not being proven to cause, you know, disease. And anyways, so I don't have, I really do not want to have an opinion on that because I really believe and I've learned as time goes by, never have an opinion on something you really do not know. But I do not have a negative opinion. Because I really kind of like blown away by their reporting. Okay. And the fact is that we do, we have to have companies look into the relationship. And obviously LabCorp and Quest are looking into one by one, you know, and sometimes we put panels together like I do, but we, we, 
I dream of a day before I die that we can see ratios in reporting and we see relationships um, because really it's more than two dimensional. It's you have thyroid, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, uh, prolactin. You have so many hormones. You have the, the endorphins and serotonin and dopamine, which, by the way, we have no accurate testing in 2022. I've been looking because I, you know, obviously dopamine rules our lives. I'm reading a book about dopamine right now. Dopamine is really what makes us do stuff. And serotonin, obviously, is like you're talking about the gut, leaky gut. 90% of serotonin comes from the gut, you know. And, and people don't know that 85% of the immune system comes from the gut. And we have a lot of uh, issues with the gut in HIV. So I've been obsessed with leaky gut. Uh, I'm obsessed with the microbiome and the effect yes. of microbiome on mood. I mean, those bugs there, and we have more bugs than even cells in our body. Well, they're actually ruling our mood. They're ruling our serotonin. They're ruling not only our hormones, they're ruling everything. They metabolize food into vitamins. Without them, we wouldn't have B vitamins. So now for the first time, because this is very exciting, the PCR testing, and you heard PCR testing with um, COVID, obviously, PCR testing, PCR testing, polychain um, um, reaction testing, which is a very detailed testing to see what species you have in your gut now, because I am obsessed. I'm a cell microbiome by because I thought we have a lot of problems with GI in HIV. The immune system is there. I even have bloating. My biggest problem is either blood pressure and bloating. And by the way, people, most guys think they have, the bloating is caused by estradiol. So that, that's why one of the main reasons guys take an astrosource because they're holding water. I have to say, it's not the gyno, it's the water, which is, we can talk about that later. That's a, it's a salt, it's a sodium um, metabolism by the kidney tissue. It's not estradiol. But anyway, so the gut is my obsession right now. And what I've learned, uh, because we have um, several researchers in HIV and part of HIV cure um, committees, Anyways, we're looking at the effect of the microbiome or actually changing the microbiome to improve immune function and even to improve mood and improve um, hormone levels. But we are basically in diapers. I mean, they're starting to identify the species that are key. But the more they dig, the more species they find, right? And they're also at ratios of them. So I do not want to go into that because otherwise... I'm not an expert on microbiome, but I take probiotics and I only take ones that they have studied. And yeah, I see, I do see an improvement in GI. And the, the HPTA stuff, and I'm jumping really quickly, otherwise we won't. The HPTA dysfunction or hypothalamic pituitary, hypothalamus pituitary, mm -hmm. uh, testicular, testicular or gonad gonadal axis. And I mean, so women have gonads, which are the ovaries. So, so HPTA or H HPTG or HPTG axis or SPG axis. I think it's, I think it's HPTO. It, yeah. It's ovarian axis way for women. Well, gonads. The gonads are testable yeah, yeah. on all right ovaries. Uh, some guys without, not on testosterone, I really have an, a dysfunction in that axis. They have either low LH, low FSH, which is the two hormones that come from the, um, you know, the brain center. And that's why they produce low testosterone in their testicles. They're not being stimulated. Or some guys have enough or high and their testicles are dormant and the Leydig cells are kind of not producing testosterone anyway. So there are two types of hypogonadism. They're both treated the same, but they're really dysfunctional. So when we do steroids, when we do testosterone, we shut down the HPTA. The you know, LH shuts down, FSH shuts down. So I get a lot of questions. What? Ha why? We're, there are two hormones there that are shut down by testosterone the replacement. And those hormones were put there by nature for a reason. Is there any long-term consequences of having LH and FSH of zero for years? My LH and FSH has been zero for 35 years. Yeah, I've been on testosterone for that long. So obviously there are consequences. Uh, uh, Fertility, some guys never regain fertility when you're exposed to, to testosterone or anabolics for a long time. What Dr. Lipschultz here at Baylor has been finding out, because he's a, one of the ones that looked at HCG combining with testosterone, is that only 66% of men 
that were on testosterone gels or testosterone injections. There are all kinds of um, protocols that were added 500 I use three times a week of HCG. 66% of them regain um, sperm production to, to an okay level for fertility. 33% did not respond. The ones that did not respond were older men like me and men that had been on the juice or testosterone for a long time. So those that have a strong HPTA dysfunction that cannot be recovered even by HCG, those are 33% of us, okay? So, um, and they're starting to do, believe it or not, studies mixing, but blending clomiphene and HCG. And they actually, and most people freak out, oh, it's too much estrogen, but it actually seen really good results on fertility and HPTA access for those men that do not respond to HCG. Another thing that I didn't mention in the first video that is very important, because we talked about HCG and the FDA, is that the biologics law that was passed by, by the FDA that um, shuts down basically the production of HCG in compounding pharmacies also shut down the FSH. Pro, um, they were making a oh. hey, a lot of compounding. Mm -hmm. FSH is super expensive. It works really well to increase sperm count, but it's super expensive. And something that most people don't know is that men and women in this country that, could not, that do not, cannot conceive a child are going through IVF and they have to go through at least three to five cycles if they're lucky. Each cycle costs $25,000 because they have to pay out of pocket insurance on some them pay for HCG and FSH or HMB, which I don't want to come. Um, and now that compounding has been basically blocked from producing those two, they have to pay that. Compounding would have a cycle cost like something like $5,000 instead of twenty five. dollars so that's something else that, and I'm sorry to digress, but I just remember that HCG is just part, of, is very cheap compared to FSH. FSH is, is super expensive. I'm sorry that I had to jump into that because I, if I don't mention no. it. No, no, I wanted to, that's what I wanted to ask you. And we were talking about the HCG. I mean, I mean, is this just a power grab? Is this a money grab by the combined effort with the FDA know, and the pharmaceutical? I, I'm not a conspiracy theory guy. But I'm starting to get like I am in this in this case. I'm not. I, I really try not to piss off the FDA because obviously I had I have a good history with the FDA. I was part of review committees for drugs in HIV, okay? So obviously, and they were I'm, I'm extremely, God, extremely good to us. Um, but this group of biologics group is a separate group. The biologics group doesn't really, is not in touch with consumers. It's not in touch True. with patients. The drug group has been around for a long time. Remember, biologics is a new thing. Biologics is uh, a lot of the rheumatoid arthritis drugs, a lot of the new drugs that are for immune, autoimmune lupus. Those are biologics, and that's a hot field, uh, probably 10 years old. Drugs have been produced and approved by the FDA for a lot longer. So these new people, and I know this is on video or sound, but these people are not in touch with patients. The drug people are. So that's one concern that unless we speak up, and that's why I created hormoneaccesscoalition.org, if we don't speak up and re remind them that, hey, there are people like us, we're using this stuff, and you're blocking, you're making us go for pharmaceutical grade, which is a lot more expensive. So yeah, do I think pharmaceutical lobbying, which is the strongest lobbying in this country, including ins insurance companies, are paying off? Um, yes, for the first time I can say, and I hate to say it because I hate to say it really. It's the only explanation I have. Why mess with all drugs, all products, biologics like ACG that have been produced for years by small companies, compounding pharmacies that for cheaply, I mean, Empower used to sell it for like what, $75, $80 for 12,000 I use. Now you have to pay 300 and be on a waiting list. Why do that unless somebody died or somebody there was a safety issue. So mm -hmm. the main thing I, I'm like for the first time saying, wow, this is really a power grab. This is really a pharmaceutical um, uh, lobbying um, effect. And because that's the only thing that could explain why would they go against something so cheap, so genetic. So instead of just letting be, okay, HCG, 
is not included in a new bill. Only the fancy drugs that cost usually fifty thousand dollars a year are included, right? So, anyways, I don't. I don't think it, it sounds like conspiracy when you're just looking at the data, and it clearly seems like there's a conflict of interest. Like, it's you're not trying to be draw any strange lines. It's just like I'm hanging out with David. There's a chance I might know David and do something to help David, right? Like, that's pretty fucking obvious. Uh, but uh, I wanted to ask you a question about peptides. Uh, I'm fascinated with peptides. Peptides are awesome. Like, most of them are natural, right? Even though they're synthesized. And there's so low side effects. So what are you seeing in the Excel community around peptides? Or have you looked into peptides yourself? Or even I think BPC is freaking awesome for the gut or irritable bowel or leaky gut. It's already been a couple studies out on, on that, but I think a lot of them are in rodents and stuff. But I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on just peptides in general or BPC. A few salt kinds of stuff because um, until um, until my viral load, viral load is like, you know, like COVID, you know, you can have viral load. Uh, my viral load, uh, in HIV, we have to have what we call undetectable viral load, uh, which is HIV is not in the blood, it's actually not detected, even though we have it in, it's hiding in our cells. That's why we're not cured. I tried um, one or two peptides and my viral load went up, okay? So I got really scared on what we don't know about the immune function and, and peptides. And I de- definitely did not want to risk my health. So I've, I've been conservative. I've tried BPC and the PT-141, which is now an approved drug for for sexual dysfunction in women, guys love it. Um, PT-141, probably the best known one. Uh, it's It can cause you to have an erection, but it takes, it can take hours for it to make it fa- uh, work. So I don't like that because obviously uh, if you're gonna have sex, you wanna be ready when you are gonna be ready, <laughs> not when the drug kicks in later. Uh, <laughs> So hey, let's, uh, me, let's meet, meet your, back in two hours. <laughs> yeah. No, no, sometimes it takes six hours, and sometimes you're getting a boner in the middle of a sleep cycle and you're sleeping. So, oh, gosh. and it gave me side effects, like, you know, so I, I don't like that. The, um, uh, what do you call the, the other one for the joint um, that is very popular, joint healing? Come on, David. Uh, TB500? TB500, BBC157. One, uh, yeah, 157. B- uh, very popular in Excel mail. Guys swear by it when it comes to uh, joint healing, tendonitis, et cetera, et cetera. Sermorelin is the only FDA approved peptide. Is they Serono dropped it. Uh, it really is useless. I want to say that they're going to hate me in different clinics. It's expensive <laughs> and the IGF one increases are only momentary. Mm-hmm. Um, um, bring bring up some more because like I think CJC, Ipamorelin, Ibutamorelin. Um, I that's the only one I liked. Uh, uh-huh. So first of all, let me say that I only when I use peptides in the past few years, after I had my experience with online peptides for uh, animal use or to give it to your rats or your mice. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had that experience and it really freaked me out. I only use compounded peptides since, you know, I know these people are at least trying to do quality control. Uh, so I use apamorelin. Apamorelin was the closest thing that I felt like a GH. Like, you know, I felt pumped. I felt a little bit of that water retention, you know, it's working because it's, and uh, the little bit of that joint ache that I usually get. So apamorelin, out of all the ones I've tried, is the only one, like I say, hmm. There's definitely GH-like qualities to this. If if we are more in, which is they call it MK MK six seven seven. seven, seven. I know they are the generics. If I are is an oral, it's the only oral that actually really increases IGF one, sustained increases. I tried it, but I could not stop eating. I could <laughs> not. Nothing satisfied me, especially uh, you know. At 25 milligrams a day, and it was compounded too, and they still they still compound it. It's kind of under the radar for the FDA. The FDA is going after peptides, uh, so they have sent a cease and desist letter to a, a lot of the compounding pharmacies that are making it. By the way, so you're only going to find them only online from companies that don't know where they're getting it from. But a beer morning is interesting. A beer morning. I wish we had a beer morning back in the days where we were wasting 
because yep. if you are skinny and you want to put on weight, there's nothing better. There's nothing mm -hmm. better. better. I've never tried Nandrolone and a beer more and together. God knows that would be explosive <laughs> um, because you, you have this insatiable appetite. Uh, for me, it never stopped. So I had to stop two weeks later because I, I gained like 15 pounds. I didn't want to get more pudgy. Um, and it gives you good energy because it also has increases cortisol in the first uh, few weeks. So your joints are actually feeling much better too. You have more cortisol, mm -hmm. but um, but only, and some people are now taking it at 12.5 milligrams every other day. I think that's probably more manageable than 25 milligrams QD. Uh, I have not tried it at that, but I do have to say that's the only one that I've seen on paper that IGF ones really are sustained. You know, it's a, yeah. a Berlin analog. So it really is an analog or similar to the 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 peptide that the body produces, stomach lining produces ghrelin. When you're hungry, it releases this peptide to make you react. Oh, I'm hungry. I need to I need to eat. But it also what it does while you're hungry, you basically start breaking down muscle tissue. Your body's like I need nutrients, so it is it starts eating up, increases IGF one. When you are about when you're really hungry. Your IGF-1, if you measure it, is really high. The body's trying to, to send IGF-1, get some of the muscle nutrients, and you feed it, the IGF-1 goes down. So if you see the IGF-1 curves during the day, it goes up before lunch, goes down after you eat. So that is girling, girling analog. So I've been ignoring Merck, the, drug, the company Merck, they have a, obviously a, a new COVID vaccine. Merck actually... C copied that effect of her and made it into a pill form. They researched it in older people that were losing lean body mass because every most older people we all lose, we all waste away slowly when we get older. Okay, you've seen it in your parents, your grandparents, and obviously people start losing. They get more frail. The loss of lean body mass makes people frail. They can walk the same, whatever. So I be more in what studied and found effective in increasing. The only thing is that half of the increase in weight was muscle and the other half was fat. Remember, these are not people that were working out. These are older men and women, um, and it was very effective. So I wish we had, as I said, Iber morning is very interesting. If you keep it at a low dose, you want to put on thighs and pump because the pump is there, the IGF, that gym pump that you get with a little bit of extra cellular water, you know? So but anyway. There's um, had, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, David. I, I just had one quick question um, because I was talking about blood glucose testing, and obviously, like insulin is the most anabolic hormone in the human body. If we can optimize insulin sensitivity, better muscle growth, et cetera, better, less inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. With albutamorlin in particular, insulin resistance is a big thing when it comes to it. So I wanted to ask your opinion on that. If you experience any insulin resistance issues or anything like that, because I believe some of the infl inflammation is usually extra blood glucose in your system that's circulating as well as some of the inflammation in the joint. So I wanted to ask uh, you on yeah. that. It's like GH. It's like GH or any yeah. effective. EGH increases blood glucose. It yep. makes you so much so that some people develop diabetes and when they get off the drug, they cannot reverse it. That's why the FDA did not approve serostim for um, later on for HIV lipodystrophy. So Ooh. all GH products tend to affect glucose, all of them. Mm -hmm. If they're GH like abiramorin, ipamorelin, all CJC, of them, any, yep. they all tend to increase glucose and decrease uh, insulin sensitivity. Uh, unlike actually steroids, I have to say anandrolone, oxandrolone, nanobar, they actually improve insulin sensitivity. They actually can decrease glucose. They actually yep. can decrease triglycerides. The first, first thing you see in a bodybuilder wow. um, is that the triglycerides go down. The LDL, whatever, they can go up or down. Triglycerides go down with testosterone, with nandrolone, oxanolone. With GH, triglycerides go up. Insulin goes up. Glucose goes up. So, yeah, it's great, you know, but the metabolic effects of GH and peptides it's the opposite of anabolic steroids when it comes to blood work. It really is. Now, is the insulin resistance, in your opinion, due to lipase, so the release of 
fat going into the bloodstream more so than the blocking of glycogen uptake in the liver. I think it's a pancreas effect. I really believe this is an effect, direct effect on the cells and pancreas. They're stimulated to produce more. That's what I think. But if it produces more insulin, you should not have more glucose. So to be honest with yeah. you, there are papers, if you Google insulin resistance growth hormone, I think there are two papers from the 90s that actually tried to look at the mechanism. I, I couldn't tell you more than yeah. Because that. once IGF-1 releases, then it helps with the glycogen uptake. So I'd assume that the um, the glycogen storage in the muscle cells from the nandrolone would actually reduce blood glucose, which I actually never even thought about that, uh, or will reduce blood glucose in the system and uh, help with the uptake of glycogen. So that's very interesting. I've literally never even thought about that until you just brought it up. Yeah. And testosterone at higher doses, nandrolone, oxandrolone, have one thing that scares me. <laughs> And I also stop oxanolone, even though you can get it by prescription for HIV, um, because of HDL drop is severe HDL. Like uh, the good cholesterol really is impacted. Uh, the body usually I can see who is bodybuilding if they show me their blood work without seeing their bodies, because their <laughs> their uh, glucose is a little high, the triglycerides are very low, the HDL is very low. Their hematocrit is high, obviously, um, and uh, the creatine, creatinine is high, even though if you do, like I said, if you do cystatin, it's not. So I can see, and that's I created a bodybuilding panel on this kind of last because of that. You can, you can actually, a doctor, well trained doctor, can see who's lying about. Obviously, they walk, somebody walks in, they're pumped up and big, and you know, but um, you can see blood work, and you can see in blood work who's a smart bodybuilder and who isn't. Not in their, obviously, their look, okay, they're ripped, and obviously, hey, you're doing great work, but show me your blood work. <laughs> no. you know, it's, it's interesting, Nelson, I, Nelson I, have a, I have a tracker that I did for all my labs, and I was just looking at it because you were talking about the triglycerides going down, and uh, yeah, I started off with my triglycerides at 196. I was just on 200 milligrams of cypionate. It dropped to 141, 141, 145, 145, 145. Better than omega-3s. It works better than omega threes. That's I've never realized that ever. Yeah, my triglycerides my, like, more tonight. My triglycerides last time I checked were like fifty two or something, and it was like wow. well, I, I do cardio regularly and eat very healthy. Are you keto? Are you keto? A lot of the times I go very low carbs. Not oh, necessarily okay. keto because if you know my girlfriend, yeah, 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 dinner, yeah, but, but no carb. That's most good. of the time. 50. Wow, I was surprised, but that's I'm having that effect, and then the testosterone, which I was not aware of. That's I mean, yeah. the HDL effect is, yes, my HDL was a little low. Yeah. I've been working on increasing that, but that's fascinating. I, I think I said genetically. That. I'm genetically gifted. My family doesn't have lipid problems. So my, H my LDL, no matter what doses I was using, that's why I don't think there's an ALDL effect. There's a triglycerides effect, for sure, 100%. And there's, it's proven, and there are lots of data on that. Triglycerides, HDL. Somebody asked me a question on XML. What blood test changes should I expect on nanolone or it's the same as testosterone high dose. There's no difference. See, it's that I said triglycerides go down, HCL goes down, hematocrit goes up, obviously, creatinine goes up, but it can be just the effect of supplements and working. Your liver function, ASD and ALT will go up or freak out your doctor, but it's nothing to do with the liver, especially if you're not taking any toxic uh, anabar, uh, uh, anabrol or anything like anabar is not really toxic to the liver. We've done studies in HIV and burning burn patients, and it's really safe oral. Anyway, so uh, yeah. yeah, you could. What's, anyway. what's the so in the TRT community, but also in the bodybuilding community, there's a, a big range of what people call therapeutic. Um, hmm. Which, but obviously, there's the you respond. I'm like 240 something pounds, right? I'm going to be respond differently than. Nelson, right? Because you said you're 190 ish, right? You're like, or somebody else who's 147, right? So, what is the range that you see on Excel, like you know, 175 milligrams what, a week what? for what? testosterone dosages? You know, uh, good question. I, I, I was wondering if we we're going to get into this. Yeah, I've seen it all, man. And it's getting crazy lately with the daily injection guys. Lots of people are going crazy for the daily injections, which never made sense to me. Uh, because esters like Cipionate and Anthate were designed on purpose to stay uh, around a little longer. Uh, the liver doesn't metabolize them as fast as the methyl testosterone. So I'm like, but a lot of guys are doing, and I tell them, I'm 63, I think around 34 years. I'm, I'm jaded. Obviously, I'm not like most young guys. 
So I tell them, hey, I'm an old guy. I'm telling you, daily injections will wear you out. There's such a thing. We, we call it in HIV. We used to have a drug that we have to inject twice a day. Um, we call it needle fatigue. You probably don't have it now. You won't have it in the first year. You're all gung-ho. Then you start slipping and your mind starts like, well, uh, I'll inject double instead of whatever. Yeah. <laughs> we call it we, t- we call it adherence we, in, in my world we call it adherence long term adherence of daily injections as a diabetic I mean they don't have a choice it's impossible you cannot be unless you really man I shouldn't say impossible there are some guys that are very disciplined I doubt that anybody can inject daily testosterone especially testosterone you can inject twice a week or even once a week depending on how you feel um but anyways, they're injecting daily because there is this thing about low. They're born with low sex hormone binding globulin, which is also another thing on say, Excel mail. I respect them at all. And so anyway, so the daily stuff is getting crazy now. I, I, I have to say, it, but okay. Then twice a week is common. Twice a week using a 27 gauge, half an inch. I, t- I came with the term, everybody's using it now. Shallow I am. There's a sub sub Q, which is under. Mm-hmm. I hate sub Q because I get red spots and yep. nobody wants to. I don't want anybody if I'm gonna have sex with somebody looking at what the hell is that? Um <laughs> you don't want you don't, so I do a 90 degrees uh angle to the shoulder, only one shoulder because I have a bad hand. I don't want to talk about this issue. But um 90 degrees with a shallow, like a half an inch insulin syringe, 27 gauge. Some guys use the 29 gauge. Just a little bit. I do 100 milligrams twice a week. Um, and many guys are doing that, either 75 or 100. A lot of, some guys are just not into this injection you know, frequency. They do once a week. Rarely. I The guys that do it once every two weeks at the old-fashioned way, they they're 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 bombarded by guys like oh you crazy you shouldn't do that whatever because you're throat <laughs> whatever that was that is when you read the testosterone package insert that's what they're saying the pharmaceuticals are telling doctors to prescribe it every two weeks what I'm seeing now is a, a renewed interest in creams and let me let me talk a little bit about that because the creams are put down by in every forum. Oh, creams are work, you know, androgel, because androgel obviously is 1.62% testosterone. It, it barely, if you get to 600, 700 nanograms, hey, you're lucky. And the the adherence rate, people drop off androgel. There's actually a study that showed that people go back, they they stop going back for a refill for a reason. But now we have the Atrevis, uh, Atrevis uh, hydrogel based compounded by everybody, Empower, all the others. I do, I tried it because I just wanted to see. Sometimes I get tired of the injections. I'm traveling. When I travel, I take my cream, the hydrogel. So I don't want to take needles with me. So I, I do the cream. My testosterone went up to like something like 1,800 nanograms on just four clicks, which is one mil. On the hydrogel, it's called the Atrevis or Atrevis. So that's become very popular on Excel Mail. Uh, obviously, I posted my blood work. I was blown away. I was like, man, because, you know, I, I did Androgel. I did test them for Testa. Or how many more? They're like 100 now. So that really, for the guys that don't want to inject, and a lot of guys don't want to inject. I don't blame them. I mean, no. So you can actually get up there. With the the compounded, it's compounded. It's two percent, but the 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 vehicle they're using is improves absorption so much more. Uh, what else? Uh, did did I, you ask you? I was gonna. I had a quick comment about the daily injections. I actually just recently mm-hmm. did, released a video on like uh, injection schedule, and I think that. Well, first off, I think a lot of guys get way too way too into in their heads with TRT. You know, oh, when I was 10 milligrams higher, I didn't have this side effect. And I'm a little bit tired today. I wonder if I need to take an extra Arimidex. And I think that people are drawn to the daily injection because they think that, like, it's like advanced TRT. You know, it's like the next microdose microdose TRT. Microdose. And I was trying to do uh, lipo C and L carnitine every day on top of my TRT. And granted, it's one milliliter as compared to like 15 milligrams of test, but. I mean, I was just like, I was looking at my the freaking bottle and I was like, man, I really do not feel like doing that today. And I, w- I feel like I would get the exact same way with the daily injection. When, when, 
I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sam. No, no. When when you were when you were talking about that, I felt like that was a, a fantastic description. There was one point where I was using hexarelin, which is a peptide, and I use that pre workout for the HGH, but it's very very short in its half life. Uh, but I found really awesome effects in the gym from that. So I would do that, and then that was also when I was testing testosterone daily injections, and I would use separate needles uh, for that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it was, and then there was one a, a short period of time where I was testing injectable SARMs on top of this, so it would be like a plethora of needles. And you get what did you call it? Fatigue, needle fatigue, or something? Needle fatigue, fatigue. needle fatigue. It's, it's well studied. It's even the you know diabetes people with diabetes don't have a choice, man. They have to, and even for them, and they have monitors, and obviously it's it's hard. And they, there's this life and death. It's not you know something to mess around with. So, yeah, I mean, I tell them, hey, I'm your cheerleader. More power to you. Go for it. Let's see how long you last. You know, like how much, especially the guys with kids, everybody has a life. If you travel, especially if you travel, and nobody's going to mess with I me. Mean, I go through through the security check and people ask, well, they're not the DEA. They're not supposed to be there intercepting drugs. or And if you do, you know. Uh, or if you're carrying your Trimix, which we haven't talked about, well, that's another another podcast. Um, yeah, but there's so. Anyways, the most uh, to answer your question in one sentence, the most common protocol that I see out there in on Facebook and my Excel mail, twice a week, seventy-five to one hundred milligrams, uh, twice a week, uh, shallow IM or sub Q. Sub Q is not as popular because people do have reactions. The shallow I am thing on the, I, I did a video, what, six years ago, seven, and that kind of got it. Because we got data, actually, finally, that sub-Q worked as well as deep I am. You guys remember, and you, you're young, but not that young. You remember when we were told one, I was using one and a half inch, mm-hmm. 23 gauge on my butt of anything, nandrolone or testosterone. Back in the days, because otherwise it would not work. Oh, okay. And then we started getting there. Wait a minute. As long as it gets in, in the body, under the fat, shallow, it works. They actually, believe it or not, the data, and we're not going to expand on this because it's a touchy subject, but the data came from female to male trans- transgenders. That's where the published, uh, was published three, four years ago, where they did, you know, a study on their blood work with IM, uh, intramuscular, and sub-Q. And Actually, a lot of the Q levels are higher than the IM. So some doctors, some doctors are still prescribing IM, even though it's more painful, more. I used to do like the loading syringe, a 20, uh, 20, 18 gauge, and then change it to the 23 gauge. I did that for 20 years because I thought that was the only way. So uh, it's, it's a lot better, thank God. And, and, and in the injection world, uh, people are catching up with that. You know, it's it's interesting. Real quick, Sam, I just wanted to mention, I was touching on, I was looking to see if there were any studies on different uh, injection frequencies for testosterone for men, and I couldn't find a single one. And it was interesting that you mentioned that that sub-Q versus IM study was done on, on, you know, uh, females transitioning to men. Without, Without that population, they would have never done that study. And, you know, why would, why is Pfizer or Merck or anyone going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to study testosterone protocols and TRT stuff because it's a generic medicine. They're not, I mean, yeah, they'll, they'll sell you the bottle for 30 bucks with your insurance, but that's not big money. Yeah. You know, they want you to buy Natesto, uh, Jatenzo, uh, Ziostead, you know, they're just all fancy delivery systems. And the only study that I could find on weekly injections was one on Ziostead. They didn't mention it, but it's an Ananthe auto injector. So, you know, yeah. I was like, that's the only reason we have that study is because of Ziostead. Because yeah. there's no money in generic testosterone. And they do it weekly. And they, that pharmaceutical company got smart and actually said, why don't we just do a sub-Q and inflate, but provide it with the ejector, which is expensive. FDA, you know, insurance pay for it in some cases. And especially for the guys that are afraid of needles, which I tell everybody, you're afraid of needles now, but it's like being a virgin. Once you lose your virginity, you'll see that it's no big deal. I mean, you'll be... You'll be amazed how many times I say that to guys. I coach guys sometimes. 
And they all laugh, but it's true. They email me, oh my God, you were so right. Because it's not, you know, it's not that painful. Correct. But anyway, so the ejector is getting kind of popular, but it's so expensive for an unpaid in a big kind of thing to inject yourself. I, I just don't see a point, but you know. What's crazy that they do, and Dave, I'll just be real quick, but uh, what they'll do is they give you like this coupon. You know, and so it's like for the first six months or a year, uh, I've talked to some people that are on Zyoset and they're like, yeah, I was, I was like, dude, that's an expensive medicine. They're like, oh, no, it's like it's like 15 bucks a month. And I'm like, just wait. And then, you know, six months or 12 months later, they go to pick up their script. They're all happy. They're out of medicine. And they're, the pharmacy's like, yeah, it's going to be seven fifty. And they're like, oh, seven hundred and seven seven dollars and fifty cents. No, 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 no. Seven fifty. And they're like. You know, it's, so it's a bait and switch kind of thing. Get they, get you with the they, they get you with a copay cards. Yeah. They really get do. you used to it. Get you, you know, reliant on that auto injector. And then I guess I'll pay it this month. And then I guess I'll pay it next month. And then boom. Yeah. <laughs> you, you brought up two forms of testosterone that I did want to bring up that was on the last episode. And we didn't dive into it. And it's actually something I'm not super versed with. And that's what I'm going to ask you. You brought up a nasal spray. I have no relative research on the nasal spray. And I thought that one was interesting. You talk about uh, um, potentially the sex hormones and stuff like that, potentially. Um, so I'm curious there. And then the other one that you brought up was a non-liver toxic testosterone. Now, I the only way that I know that hormones can get broken down into the bottom is a 17-methyl or ethyl group attached to it, which makes it liver toxic. Well, liver toxic in theories. We do know that some steroids, such as like Proviron, are not liver toxic. But um, I wanted to ask you about the orals. And the other thing that I want to ask about the orals is usually, and one reason why it wasn't popularized, because the aromatization tends to be so high from oral testosterone. So could you touch on those two? Because like I said, I'm not really versed about it, so I'm interested in that. Yeah, actually, I, I, um, yeah, I, uh, the, there's Jatenso. Um, we have a Jatenso page of Forum and Excel Mail that the guys come in because it's, it's popular, it's oral. Um, I thought it was not going to work out that well. It's actually working out pretty well. I've been following some guys that have gotten up to 700 nanograms. That's about it. I mean, um, they don't get obviously to the TRT levels that some, some of us are too used to. Um, but um, they love it. They love it because it's oral. Uh, they can take it with their vitamins and they don't have to put it on their creams. They are not afraid to pass it on to their wives or girlfriends, which creams can, you know, you can transfer uh, or their kids. So the oral is becoming more popular. It's the conservative doctors are prescribing it more because you never get to really high levels of testosterone. So bodybuilders cannot really use it. So I, I actually think I'm going to try it next month um, just because I have to try everything that's come out. And some guys are actually loving it. Um, no liver toxicity at all. There's actually data on ASD, ALT, and, and they haven't seen any. It's on decanoate. It's testosterone on decanoate. It's the same as Nevito or Avid in the United States, the long-acting the long testosterone yeah. that you inject every, well, they say every three months, but really so on eight, every eight weeks where it stays in your system. We haven't talked about that. That's not as as uh, popular in the States, even though it's approved, because my doctor, who well, has everything, he says nails in the paperwork to get it approved by insurance uh, is too long. What we, don't, what we don't get in this country is that your choice, if you're having insurance pay for it, your choice of testosterone replacement therapy is not up to you. It's not even up to your doctor. It's up to your insurance company. Insurance company makes deals with these companies where they get a discount. So they pay for one product and not the other. They pay for this and not that. So your doctor, if he wants to prescribe something that is not in their formulary, he has to write a long um, medical necessity, blah, 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 pre pre which most doctors are tired of because they're busy. So a lot of the insurance paid TRT ha is determined by the insurance policy and by your doctor's willingness to write the damn letter, which some of them hate. And sometimes you don't get it approved. Some guys get around that by just downloading a good RX coupon and they're hooked on six months and then they're on their own, like you said. But um, <laughs> so that's what's happening. Anyways, I'm sorry. So that's why most many guys are going for the cash clinics, the ones that don't take insurance, because there's a lot of freedom there. On Obviously, they're 
they push injectables or the creams are from compounding pharmacies. They have more HCG access they used to. So a lot of guys have to pay out of pocket, average 115, 20, 120 dollars a month. But I let many guys uh, like me um, have doctors that are really knowledgeable or urologists that use compounding also. So the best world that you can have as a TRT patient, the best option you can have is a very educated doctor or somebody that is not educated but is willing to work with you. And I know <laughs> um, that is willing to open, to prescribe compounded products, which are cheaper out of pocket. They are not covered by insurance, but they're so cheap that usually they're cheaper than copays. Those doctors tend to prescribe HCG, testosterone injectable, the nasal uh, cream and sprays also co- can be compounded. All of this oral is now compounded too. So all those pharmaceutical products are compounded and they're paid out of pocket, but they're they're cheaper, right? So when somebody emails me and I get a lot of emails, Nelson, I'm trying to get on testosterone. My insurance company denies, is denying the claim. Uh, they say my testosterone is 380 and I'm not low enough. That's usually the number one. Or they don't like, they don't have this product and formula. What should I do? I, I can't, you know, go, tell your doctor to fax the, pre- the script to a company pharmacy. You'll be able, you know, $50, $60 out of pocket. So a lot of guys are like, they come to the forums, oh my God, my doctor would not like to, would not, don't want to prescribe. So that's another issue. It's like, okay, either educate your doctor or move away. Or he prescribed, but the insurance company doesn't want to pay. Okay, have your doctor, if he's willing to, fax a prescription to compounding, you'll get your product cheaper. So there's so many complications. That's why some guys get so frustrated that it's so hard or they, that they're, Nandrolone, the testosterone came up at 400, but they have all the symptoms and the insurance companies, other doctors say it's not obviously low enough. I would tell you permutations and combinations of of different circumstances that guys are going through. The best optimal scenario is, this is me, just my opinion, having a urologist, because we all have prostates, we all have urologists Mm -hmm. know everything about the... The uh, male and female genitalia, too, is not only that. And those are the ones that we're going to need more and more as we get older. Get a urologist, and thank God there are lots. Urology is the most progressive, well, medical specialties in the United States now when it comes to hormones. Not endocrinologists. Yep. Number one mistake a lot of guys think when they're Googling, they, they're looking for an endo. Endos are against mm-hmm. I, most endos are against testosterone. They they can prescribe diabetes drugs, thy- thyroid drugs, but they do they they're hormone doctors, but they're not into the androgens. Okay, so when I tell people what is the best doctor, well, the best doctor is a doctor that is willing to prescribe, but if your insurance pays, or you have the luck to have a good insurance or whatever, and you can find a urologist, that's the best that can prescribe. Like here we have lip Schultz and we have big groups. Houston is a makeup for hormone replacement to be honest with you. An analytic, analytics show that Florida, Texas, California, New York are poor thing. They struggle more. They don't have as much access. It's a long story. But anyway, so the uh, all this complicates things. But if you have to look for the optimal scenario, is having the luck to have a neurologist that prescribes testosterone, prescribes HCG, prescribes whatever you need, ED drugs. Obviously, we can, we can get Viagra or ED drugs now online without a doctor. There, there are 50 apps that you can do that. So because long-term, it's good for any man to have a good relationship with a neurologist, okay? Yeah, I well, that's really interesting. I never, I never even, I know I've heard a lot of bad stories from endocrinologists, but uh, but that's interesting. You say that urologists are better to check out. Mm-hmm. I think, I think we're going to wrap this up, not because I didn't enjoy talking to Nelson. Nelson, I, I knew you were a very smart guy because I've seen the stuff that you've put out, but I didn't know that. Like, I mean, I you could go like toe to toe with some of the best endocrinologists, urologists. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that how much vast knowledge that you had. So. I really, really appreciate you coming on here and sharing that. A um, couple things to ch- go set, check out the Excel Mail Forum, 40,000 guys. That's massive. And it's been around for 12 years. So uh, check you. that out. That's a really good. I really do like the study section. I've, I've checked out a few, few of the studies on there. 
check out Discounted Labs. That's exactly discountedlabs.com. You can just order whatever labs you want. You don't need to beg your doctor for the labs. Get them. They go through Quest, so it's not like you're getting some weird lab from some weird place. You're going through Quest. And then what is it? The uh, Hormone Alliance Coalition.org. Hey, I should have made it shorter. Uh, Hormone Access <laughs> Coalition. Uh, I, I could have Hormone. called it Hormone Coalition, but the word access is very important to the FDA. When they hear that, that's when they get yeah. activated. They get PTSD on access. So Hormone Access Coalition. .org. Yep. And Definitely go to that a, one. I did that. that. It takes like a minute or so. And I mean, HCG is pretty much gone from the market right now. So you need to let the FDA know. You need to let, and, this, and it, the website does it for you. It sends the email for you. You just put in some information, click, 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 and you're good. Because right now we don't have HCG. So if you're on TRT, you're trying to have a kid. Anyway, but I want to thank Stan and Dave, as always, for being here. You can find us on social media. If you're listening to this, we, we're on YouTube. If you're watching it, we are on every podcast. Go check out Nelson Virgil, Excel Mail, Discount Labs, Hormone Access, Coalition.org. Um, Nelson, thank you so much. I am really, th I can't thank you enough for coming on here and sharing so much knowledge. I know Dave and Sam had a good time. So thanks, you guys. Uh, thank you for listening to the Too Much Test podcast and uh, come back for the next one. Go check out Nelson. Thank you for having me, and let's do it again, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. You're welcome back anytime. All right, thank so. you.